after uh, the invitation to come, but thank you all for uh, showing up. I got a I got a question. I haven't even started. Okay, um, I'll try and be better about that. Um, uh, I know it's early. Um, I have to say it's, it's pretty intimidating preparing a talk on pediatric burns uh, for a room full of people who potentially have been treating pediatric burns for a lot longer uh, than I have, particularly when there haven't been terribly many paradigm shifts in, in terms of the treatment of pediatric burns over the course of the last 30 to 40 years. Um, but I have just come off a, a, a year fellowship at the BC Children's Hospital, uh, which I called the Pediatric uh, Burn Dressing Fellowship, um, where we treated a fair number of both in and outpatient burns. And I thought there were a couple of tricks uh, and things that I could offer and, and perhaps a couple of suggestions when it comes to uh, our management of pediatric burns here in the uh, um, I think the important, the topic is important and relevant because when you look at uh, pediatric plastic surgery trauma in general, it is probably the largest contributor in terms of uh, emergency room visits. And depending on uh, where you look and what, uh, what statistics you're looking at, it's either the first or second single largest um, contributor to emergency room visits for, PD, uh, for kids under the age of five. Um, and so it is a significant um, uh, contributor to both the expense, um, but also in terms of manpower. Um, it requires a fair amount of contribution, both uh, in terms of number of people involved and in terms of um, ongoing outpatient visits. Um, it, in terms of today, uh, I'm just going to briefly overview some of the demographics uh, and why this matters to us, uh, including some of our local statistics here. Uh, which have been co contributed by uh, Deb Cavana and Sharon Horton. Uh, we'll talk about how kids' pediatric burns are different than in adults. Uh, we'll review some of the emergency assessment and management, which will be uh, routine to a lot of you. I'm going to propose a couple of strategies for wound care, uh, which perhaps are a little bit different than some of the things that uh, we've been consistently using here in Victoria. Uh, then for some of the people who don't get an opportunity to see what happens after they're seen in the emergency department, we'll talk a little bit about operative uh, management, including some of the ongoing scar care and follow-up uh, that we have to address. Um, I'll give a shout-out to one of the burn nurses in Vancouver who spent the last couple of years developing a promotional program uh, in order to reduce the number of emergency room visits that we see. Um, uh, and uh, while I'm doing this, my hope is that I can emphasize uh, how multiple, multiple disciplinary um, uh, caring for a pediatric burn patient really is. Um, for those who I haven't had a chance to meet yet, uh, I'm actually an island girl born in Campbell River. Um, I did my undergraduate degree at Yale, my med school at UBC. Uh, I did my plastic surgery fellowship at UBC as well, although I actually started out as an ENT resident. Uh, and then I've done a couple of fellowships since that time, one in London, Ontario, where I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Robinson. I'm so glad she's joined us here in Victoria. Um, uh, and then followed by uh, a trip to Vancouver. Um, I will be using the name of some products today. I don't have any connection whatsoever to any of the companies. Um, a lot of the recommendations uh, that uh, I will make are just based on my own experience, those of my mentors, and certainly those of the more informed burn nurses uh, who kind of guide a lot of what we do. Um, I'd also like to give a shout out because this is, I guess, the unofficial VHA Burn Week. And coincidentally, uh, we have a visiting uh, doctor from Calgary, Dr. Duncan Nickerson, who uh, unfortunately arrives this evening as opposed to this morning. But over the course of the next couple of days, he's going to be giving a couple of talks. Um, he's also going to be visiting our site and just having a look at what we do in terms of the treatment of uh, burns in general, including pediatric burns. Um, uh, his talk uh, this tomorrow afternoon, I believe, uh, tomorrow morning, uh, is care of the patient with major thermal injury, a surgeon's perspective on the first week. Uh, the following afternoon, so tomorrow afternoon, I believe he's giving a talk called Burn Dressings, a Surgeon's Perspective on Closing the right, Choosing the Right One at the Right Time. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, on Friday afternoon, the Mid-Sized Burn Center Staying Relevant and Viable or Friday morning. So uh, Dr. Taylor is going to be his local host, and the two of them are going to be spending the time 
uh, chatting to those of you who are involved in terms of providing care to our patients here. So uh, if anybody sees that, I can say hi. So pediatric burns uh, differ a little bit than those that we see in adults um, because they tend to have unique mechanisms. So we see more scald injuries in kids than we do in adults. Uh, we also see more contact burns in kids, and this is something that we're actually starting to see more of over the course of time as opposed to less of, uh, in the, uh, to the extent that with the introduction of gas fireplace uh, with the glass covering, um, we're seeing more and more toddlers who have contact burns from and significant palmer burns uh, as a result of contact with that. Uh, kitchens become a more dangerous place for kids, um, and also there's also the uh, always you have to have a suspicion in terms of abuse uh, when evaluating a child with a pediatric burn, which is a little bit different than when we assess our adult population. They have physiologic differences, which contribute to their uh, difference in terms of how we treat them as opposed to adults. So uh, they have a higher surface area to volume ratio, and this changes over the course of ages. Uh, and that contributes in terms of our assessment of total body surface area. They also have thinner skin and thinner dermis. So for any given temperature, uh, they are more likely to sustain a more significant and deeper burn uh, with any given exposure. The body distribution is different. So their heads make up a greater significant portion of their body as opposed to their uh, extremities, uh, which is obviously different than in adults. They have different wound care needs in terms of daily dressing changes and how we go about approaching them, uh, can, uh, taking into account uh, the parents at the same time. Uh, they also require longer follow-up. Uh, so many of the kids, when we see them, are not skeletally mature, will continue to grow, and can have sequelae as a result of growth spurts uh, uh, over the course of time. Uh, and then addressing not only the child who has a pediatric burn, but also some of the psychosocial uh, components, uh, because it is a stressful time for families. For those of you who've had an opportunity to uh, see an injured child with a burn in the emergency department, a lot of times uh, the caregiver who was present at the time of the burn uh, have huge uh, issues around guilt. Um, and so there's a whole um, psychosocial uh, model that has to exist in terms of uh, managing these uh, traumas. In terms of why this is relevant here to us in BHA, these are the statistics from 2011 for our burn center. Um, uh, and so the numbers were not great in 2011. We saw uh, five patients uh, who were inpatients under the age of 17 that were required admission uh, for a total body surface area greater than 10%. Uh, we saw 32 outpatients uh, that were under the age of 17 in the year uh, 2011. 2012, something seems to have happened. We're not really quite sure, but we've already met those uh, numbers uh, for 2011 uh, at this time. So as of August, uh, halfway through the year, we were already up to our 2011 numbers, and we're not yet into fireplace season, um, so we'll have to kind of see what happens over the course of the rest of the year. Um, but we've already had five inpatient admissions uh, with the average total body surface area of about 9%. Uh, we've seen 31 outpatients requiring multiple outpatient uh, trips with a total body surface area average of about 3%. 55% um, of them are under the age of two, which I think is one of the most staggering statistics uh, that we see is that so many of these are in the young child who's almost uh, preambulatory, so to speak. 61% um, of them are scalds, which is consistent with what we see around the world in terms of some of the other burn literature. And a full third of them are uh, contact burns, uh, which is those fireplace injuries that we were alluding to earlier. And that's something that's relatively new that we're starting to see in terms of the burn literature that's out there. It used to be that flame burn far and away was the greatest contributor to uh, pediatric burns. And it's not definitely not the case anymore. Um, how does these numbers compare to what we see elsewhere? Uh, so this is a paper from 2008, um, and it was looking at a 10-year uh, survey of burns in Canada. Uh, they were using data from Statistics Canada um, uh, using ICD-9 codes. 
Um, and what they showed essentially is over the course of that 10 year period that we were looking at, uh, the incidence of pediatric burns declined, which is great to see. Um, but the populations that continue to be the most at risk are those that we've noticed here in Victoria. So those that are either very young and under the age of five. Uh, specifically, those under the age of two seem to be the ones that are most at risk. This is from uh, two separate studies, uh, one from pediatrics on the top in 2009, and that was from a group in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, they gathered data uh, in the U.S. again over roughly the same 10-year period. They did it from 1990 to 2003. Uh, they used their data from the National Electronic Injury Surveillance System and they too found that the incidence of burns for all comers uh, was declining, although for the very young uh, it continued to be higher than the rest of the age groups. Um, the other thing that we're seeing, uh, which is consistent across um, uh, all populations, whether or not it's the US, Australia, or here, uh, is that contact burns are on the rise, uh, potentially, um, uh, for all uh, pediatric uh, exposures. So um, given that introduction and given that it is something that I think is relevant to what we do here in Victoria, I'm going to talk a little tiny bit about how kids differ than adults mostly and, and so one of the ways they differ is in the mechanisms. Uh, so this is an example of a scald burn. This is a four-year-old who is uh, making tea with granddad um, and happened to grab the cup because uh, she wanted a sip. Um, uh, and even with less than 125 cc's of hot boiling water, you can end up with a burn in this child that was close to 8% total body surface area. So it's a relatively small volume and a relatively large injury. Um, uh, another uh, mechanism that you hear about are bottoms on uh, tables, uh, coffee cups without lids, uh, tea kettles with uh, fun handles to pull, um, uh, and all of these seem to be equal offenders in terms of what we see and why we see it. Uh, in terms of why we see scald burns, well, I think you know the age is, is such that they're starting to cruise, they're starting to toddle, um, uh, parents are starting to give them a little bit more independence, they don't need constant uh, surveillance. Um, uh, and a lot of times these things are just too tempting for kids as they just sort of try and mimic what they see adults do in terms of taking sips of water. Um, why scald burns are so significant, and we alluded to this a little tiny bit earlier in terms of how their physiology is different, um, but with a larger total body to surface area ratio, it doesn't take much water before you have a relatively significant total body surface area burn. We also talked about how the skin is thinner and therefore with a lesser temperature over lesser time, uh, you can end up with a more significant injury. So for example, if you had 60 degree water in an adult, it would take about 30 seconds to burn you. It takes about a second in an infant for that temperature of water to cause the same degree of injury. And so this is a, another example of those contact burns that we were talking about. And um, I've heard this story quite a few times where uh, kids uh, starting to cruise, starting to toddle, and boy, doesn't it look nice, those colors over there. And what families don't realize is that the temperature on the glass can up to, often get up to about 150 degrees centigrade, and it takes about four hours for it to cool. Um, so uh, they're, uh, they're not benign in terms of the new... Uh, uh, renovations that we see now in terms of the transfer from wood burning fireplaces uh, to gas fireplaces in most in most homes. Uh, often in adults with a contact burn the most common mechanism was we'll see something like a hot water bottle that was left on too long and somebody who was insensate or curling up next to a propane heater while camping outside uh, but certainly in kids this is the most common thing that we see. Now this is a relatively rare burn in a child, but it is unique to the pediatric population. Uh, we saw three of these uh, in my year. Uh, I thought it was something that was kind of on, uh, on the way out, but I, I saw three of these in my year in Vancouver. And this is an electrical cord burn, uh, so children uh, that manage to find their way near a cord that's plugged into a wall, chew on it, somehow get through the cable, and then uh, sustain a burn uh, to the oral commissure. And these are concerning for uh, two reasons. Uh, their total body surface area burn is not large. They often have very little needs in terms of uh, pain requirements, but they are at risk for rupture of the labial artery. And a lot of times that comes in a delayed fashion. So 
uh, mom and dad are at home seven days later uh, sitting around running with Johnny and all of a sudden he spurts blood on the wall um, and that can be quite traumatic to families and so it requires a little bit of education at the time of presentation. Uh, the other thing is that this is a very difficult anatomic area to reconstruct and so while it is a very small burn it has a really long-standing impact in terms of, uh, in terms of their long-term follow-up. And finally, uh, there are, uh, uh, disappointingly so, um, but always the need to maintain a level of suspicion with regards to abuse uh, when it comes to pediatric burns. Um, and so some of the things that they will talk about in terms of what tweaks uh, your attention is the injury that doesn't seem to be consistent with the history from the family, uh, where they have submersion patterns, so it looks like they've been held and dunked uh, into something in a child that isn't yet ambulatory, where the flexion creases tend to be spared um, because most kids will have the automatic reflex where they curl up into a ball um, and therefore spare most of their flexion creases if they have an accidental burn, um, uh, where the child seems to exhibit uh, symptoms where they tend to be more passive and not as attentive as you would think in, a, in the instance of a trauma, uh, and certainly if they have uh, um, a delay to presentation or if there's other associated injuries which makes you suspicious. So in terms of the emergency room assessment of a burn, that really isn't too much different than in adults. And most people in the room have had an opportunity to have a look at a burn and to be able to tell the difference between a first, second, and third degree burn. And essentially what that, what that does is tell us the difference in terms of how deep it, it goes down through the skin and what structures are potentially involved. So a first degree being burn, uh, to review for those who may not uh, be familiar, is a burn that is involving uh, the top layer only. Uh, it tends to be relatively hot and red and painful, and it usually heals on its own uh, within about 10 days, and we give the example of a bad sunburn. A second degree burn, you'll see blistering. It too is pretty hot and red, um, but depending on the depth of, depth of the dermis involved will determine how quickly it will heal. And then finally, a third or fourth degree burn are those that involve at least the full thickness of the dermis and potentially into structures underneath. The challenging thing uh, about that, um, and uh, the reason that that becomes uh, a harder concept than it sounds in terms of three classifications of burns, is because often when you see a burn for the first time, this is kind of what you're faced with, where you see some parts that look a little bit red, and some parts that look a little bit blistered, and some parts that maybe look a little bit white. And so often in the initial assessment, it's difficult to tell exactly which way this burn is gonna go. Um, so we give a classification of I, and I is the plastic surgeon's uh, indeterminate burn, which essentially gives us a way out. And what that tells us is we think it's deep, we think it's either a second or third degree burn, or what we refer to, refer to as at least a partial thickness burn, uh, but we're not sure yet how it's gonna go. Um, uh, and so indeterminate is sometimes something that you'll see us right in the chart uh, in, in terms of assessment of initial burn depth. Total body surface area calculations are important when it talks about whether or not this is a burn that needs to be transferred or whether or not this is a burn that needs to be resuscitated. A lot of times here we'll see uh, the uh, rule of nines uh, uh, anatomic figures in terms of assessment of total body surface area burns. What I'd like to see introduced more is the London Browder chart, um, and this is actually harder to find sometimes in the emergency departments and wards than we'd like. Um, and what this does is reflect the changes in total body surface area burn for, um, for pediatric patients. So in an adult, the head, both front and back, represents about 9% of their total body surface area. In a one-year-old, it's about 20%. So it really makes a significant difference in terms of an, your assessment of total body surface area, but also what you end up doing in terms of your resuscitation. There are apps available for this. Um, uh, I've looked at some of the both uh, free and not so free apps. They don't work very well. Um, there isn't really anything out there yet which gives you the ability to kind of enter in your total body surface area uh, accurately yet, in my opinion. Uh, so a lot of times uh, what you'll see me doing is standing there actually with the coloring chart next to the patient, lifting up a drape and actually coloring it on uh, before you do your calculation. Um, the other thing about kids is that they do have some things that are the same as adults, um, and, and occasionally you will see circumferential burns requiring escherotomies either to be done in the emergency department or upstairs in the operating room. 
uh, one of the things that wasn't documented in what I read, but certainly seemed to be a, a growing trend in Vancouver, is the Axe body spray lighter combination. Um, uh, we saw quite a few kids uh, uh, who are starting to get into early preteen age uh, who have seen some movie somewhere where they spray and light. Um, and unfortunately, they tend to wear nylon tracksuits at the same time. So um, uh, I saw three burns uh, last year that were Axe body spray uh, lighter combinations. Um, and so it, uh, particularly, I think, when for us, uh, the things to keep in mind is when we are accepting care of these children from other places, which we occasionally will do, uh, it's really important to get the history on the phone. And I think uh, for me and in this child was to emphasize that there are certain primary uh, things that can be done, like take the burning sock off before they arrive or get sent in the ambulance. Um, uh, so things that seem relatively intuitive, I think uh, it's nice to have them reinforced at any occasion. So once we've had a look at the burn, we've determined that it's either a second or third degree burn. And once we've had a look at the total body surface area, we can then decide whether or not we think that this is a burn that's going to require supplementation in terms of fluid resuscitation. Uh, depending on where you go, that burn either is a burn between 10 or 15 percent total body surface area. For children, sometimes, although we'll admit them for a total body surface area burn of 10%, uh, we occasionally can get away with oral hydration uh, for this uh, age group. Um, uh, so something that uh, they have to take at least 1.5 times their uh, maintenance fluids in the beginning. And we keep a close eye on their urine output to ensure that they're getting adequate perfusion during this time. Uh, but most uh, of this age will end up getting referred to, at least to a burn center uh, and often admitted for resuscitation. In terms of what fluid do we use, uh, like adults, we use lactated ringers. For the most part, we use the Parkland formula, which is changing over the course of time to have less and less fluid involved. So initially, it was four cc's per kilogram per hour. Now we're starting to see three to four. In some instances, you'll see two to four cc's per kilogram per hour. And that's a response to the fact that we've had a lot of instances where mo with morbidity and mortality associated with over-resuscitation. So we've tended to drop those numbers down over the course of time and we've made more of a focus on endpoint monitoring and right now the one that seems to be most currently in use is uh, your, your output monitoring in children unlike in adults we're shooting for a higher your uh, goal your output of closer to a cc per kilo per hour as opposed to half a cc per kilo per hour um, and one of the things to keep in mind is that for those that are less than 20 kilograms they don't have huge uh, um, glycogen stores and so therefore are prone to becoming relatively hypoglycemic. So in addition to their uh, resuscitation formula, we add in uh, maintenance fluids with some glucose. If you have a look at the literature, there are lots of studies uh, which uh, talk about different uh, adjuvants to the treatment of uh, admitted burn patients. And we'll, you'll see lots of studies looking at the use of colloids uh, as an adjuvant uh, to resuscitation, hypertonic saline, uh, high-dose vitamin C, which I thought was quite interesting, uh, the use of propranolol. Uh, people have talked about insulin, uh, steroids, human growth factor, uh, EPO, all of them seem to be uh, studies that have been done and, and some of them showing I think some good results in terms of particularly wound healing. So if you look at um, uh, recombinant human growth hormone uh, and EPO and insulin, uh, they've done studies where they look at healing of donor sites um, and they found that the donor sites tend to heal, heal more quickly. Uh, and so therefore in a large burn they can re-harvest from that area a bit faster and get uh, coverage for uh, skin. Uh, which is great, um, but there are some downsides um, in terms of metabolic disturbances with some of the growth hormones um, and uh, with the steroids. Uh, one of the things that seems to be uh, being studied more often in terms of the trials that are out there now is a combination of propranolol and uh, growth hormone. Uh, and the theory and behind this is that the propranolol actually helps to decrease some of the metabolic need and the cardiac demand. And that seems to have a beneficial out, uh, input uh, or output uh, in terms of uh, their um, lean body surface, their lean body mass, and in terms of their uh, protein metabolism. So there are some initial studies uh, which show that these things may be things that we'll see on the horizon in the future, uh, although none of them I saw in use in Vancouver. And there are some 
pediatricians in the room. I, I don't think any of these are anything that we would add to our um, um, uh, our treatment here. Um, I, I put this up because this is something that we'll start. We'll, we'll be seeing uh, in the near future with regards to the. Uh, in fact, this is already available in British Columbia um, for the treatment of adult burns. And so, if you are a doc in the periphery uh, in British Columbia and you have a burn that you want to send to a burn center and you call BC Bedline, they will forward this information to you. And this is a standardized uh, assessment tool uh, which has been developed by the people in Vancouver. Uh, which includes the calculation of their total body surface area, which includes the initial resuscitation, which includes things that they want in terms of endpoint uh, end organ monitoring. And this is distributed to whoever needs it uh, around the province as a way of trying to establish some consistency in the treatment uh, of burns uh, before they arrive at the burn uh, centre. And by the way, there are two burn centres in BC, one in Vancouver and us, we are an official burn centre. Uh, this is under development for pediatrics, um, uh, so it's, they tell me, very close to being uh, adopted and approved uh, by the team at BC Children's. So it will be something that will be available uh, very quickly uh, for those who have any interest, and it should be relatively easy to access. Um, once the burn has been assessed uh, and uh, we've initiated our resuscitation, um, uh, the, uh, then the question becomes what do we do with it in terms of how do we treat it. For a burn that is obviously full thickness, a lot of times we can make decisions about surgery right away. Uh, for burns that are obviously superficial, uh, we can give the parents some reassurance and feel relatively comfortable that uh, there won't be a lot that's required in terms of ongoing surveillance. But for those burns that are indeterminate or at least partial thickness and depth, uh, the goal is to keep them clean and free of uh, bacterial burden uh, while we allow them to heal on their own. And you'll see a lot of different choices for burn dressings out there. The most commonly uh, chosen are uh, either an ointment based, so you can see the flamazine and the polysporin options. Uh, those are uh, great dressings. They are antibacterial. Um, they do require changing at least once or twice a day. So that's the downside to that. Uh, we also have lots of different gauze dressings which are available, many of them now incorporated with silver, and the two most common that we'll see are Acticoat and Restore. Uh, Restore is something new to me here in Victoria. Um, it was uh, a suggestion by one of the burn nurses, and so it's what we've introduced in terms of our burn dressing carts, uh, and I think it's going to be a great addition in terms of uh, our uh, treatment, particularly for pediatric wound management. Um, uh, there are Cochrane reviews available looking at the different types of burn dressings. This was uh, from 2010. Uh, they found 26 randomized control trials looking at different uh, treatments for burns, all burns in general, not specifically pediatrics. Uh, they essentially found that all of them were bad. Um, uh, so there really no, are no good studies out there, um, but they did talk about the fact that there were lots of different mechanisms for wound uh, treatment, so anything from hydrogels, paraffin gauze, biosynthetics, hydrocolloid, polyurethanes, and fiber dressings, and many of them we've seen, uh, particularly some of the nurses here are more familiar. Generally speaking, they talked about the goal of a good burn dressing would be one that absorbs excess fluid but maintains a humid uh, wound environment to allow for granulation and also re-epithelialization. It's something that allows for movement, particularly when it covers a joint. It prevents infection and decreases bacterial load, um, but it also minimizes pain uh, with application and change. And uh, it should be cheap. Uh, and I think one would argue, too, that the fewer number of dressing changes that you can do, the better. Um, while they said that there weren't any good studies out there, they did come to the conclusion that flamazine was essentially no good. And that was their, their conclusion is that uh, flamazine doesn't really, there is no indication to use flamazine. Um, and, and in fact, they found that uh, in some studies, flamazine was actually toxic to keratinocytes. And in some studies, they found that um, uh, wound healing was actually delayed and there was a greater need for skin grafting in, tr in uh, patients who'd been treated with uh, flamazine dressings. And that's uh, one of the dressings that we'll see applied commonly, I think, uh, in many places in the world. Um, so uh, having 
already revealed my bias. Um, I'm going to try and find some ways to kind of talk, uh, to defend it. Um, uh, and I see David shaking his head in the back, um, so that's good. Um, uh, <laughs> Um, uh, there are a couple of studies out there showing that there is a benefit to using silver impregnated dressings uh, as opposed to flamazine. This was a study uh, that came out of Ohio in 2007. They had a small number of patients that was 37. Uh, and they compared uh, silver dressing, aquacel silver it's called, uh, which is more of a um, uh, fibrinous, uh, looks like fiberglass actually, that has a bit of silver impregnated into it. And that's designed to go on to the burn and stay on the burn. Uh, and so that doesn't get changed at all. Uh, and they compared that to um, flamazine, uh, which they did as uh, BID dressing changes. And their study endpoint was how quickly could they get them out of hospital. And they found that they can get them out of hospital much faster uh, if they were to use the aquacel dressing. So that was uh, four days compared to six days, which they found to be significantly different. Um, uh, there is a study also from Vancouver, hence the bias, um, uh, talking about uh, Acticote outpatient dressings as opposed to uh, inpatient dressings is from 2006. Uh, they looked at 30 patients, they used a historical control of flamazine dressings, and they found a difference of 1 versus 13 inpatient hospital days uh, when treated uh, with, uh, with outpatient silver dressings as opposed to da uh, daily flamazine dressings. Uh, their average total body surface area burn was 7%, uh, and what they did find was that there was actually no increase in um, grafting procedures uh, with the use of Acticote or the introduction of Acticote. In fact, there was a trend, though not statistically significant, uh, to a decrease in operative procedures with the use of a silver uh, dressing. They had lots of theories about that, one being that the more times a dressing is changed, the more disruption there is to the epithelialization of the wound, and therefore potentially uh, the higher the burden in terms of actual healing. Uh, so uh, logistically speaking, I actually wanted to bring some of these samples for you, just so it's those of you who weren't familiar had a chance to look at it. But this is how I set up my tray uh, when I'm in the emergency department. Uh, you'll see this silver, silver dressing that's... Um, that's here. Uh, so that's the restore. Uh, I use a fair amount of visco paste, um, uh, which is a zinc impregnated gauze. Uh, and then there's just a burn dressing cart. And unlike Acticote, which is one of the reasons that I might become a convert to this dressing, it's relatively simple to apply. And it doesn't require the moisture that Acticote required. And Acticote was actually a relatively tricky dressing to teach um, and also to maintain because it hurt when it went on. Uh, you had to use either a hydrogel or, in the old days, and I actually, I can't believe I can say this, but I remember when Acticote was introduced. Um, uh, and, and what we used to do was admit patients and actually hook them up with sterile water in terms of IT, IV tubing, and then you would drip the water into the dressing in order to maintain the humidity of it. And, and uh, we then evolved to hydrogels, which allowed for outpatient management, then we got into saran wrapping them with, uh, you know, press and seal. Uh, then we got into visco paste. So we found ways of trying to keep that moisture in there. But inevitably, when they would come for their burn dressing change and see Sharon in the outpatient department, uh, particularly with kids, they would cr scream and cry because the dressing had dried out. Um, and so it wasn't fail safe. Um, uh, and I think Restore, we're starting to see a few of those problems. Uh, so this is essentially me uh, in the emergency department with the benefit of all my friends, uh, which I think is one of the most important things. You do need help when you're doing this. Um, uh, I also believe strongly in uh, getting a dressing on that is a good dressing that goes on right in the emergency department. Um, that doesn't have to be changed. So you get the initial painful thing over with, and then uh, ideally get the kid home as soon as you can, back to the normal environment. And there have been studies that show that if you can provide an experience which is relatively pain-free and relatively stress-free on their first exposure for every subsequent dressing change when they come to see Sharon and the outpatient, they're less traumatized. And so this is one of the things that uh, I'm so glad that I'm here and have uh, the help from colleagues like Amanda in the intensive care unit where you can provide that uh, comfort level to the kids and to their families and it just makes our job doesn't it Sharon later on uh, a lot easier so that we don't have to be there with kids and families that are screaming their heads off and scaring everybody else in the department 
So you can see with the restorer that's placed on the burn on the arm, and then I just cover it with visco paste. I like visco paste because I think it adheres nicely. I think it holds the dressing in place. Uh, I think it helps a little bit with edema control, although you have to be careful when you put it on that you don't, particularly circumferentially, that you don't cause any constriction because it does tend to harden a little bit like a cast over the course of time. Uh, and then finally, followed by some absorbent dressings for a wound like this, which is going to be exudative over the course of the next little while, uh, and then all wrapped and bundled up in their little vest. Um, and this can be done pretty quickly uh, in the matter of five to ten minutes with all the hands that you see. Um, uh, and ideally, this is a dressing which is now left on for somewhere between three and seven days. So when I was in Vancouver, we would use a double layer of active coat with uh, an intracite gel, uh, and we'd put that on and leave it for seven days. Kids, if they did not need resuscitation, would just go home without patient uh, pain management, uh, and they would come back for their first dressing change, either with the help of a bit of sedation or even just with a, a little bit of oral morphine and midazolam uh, for their first dressing change. Uh, and that was something that we think uh, helped to kind of minimize the trauma associated with some of the wound management. So this is an example you can see of an Acticoat dressing that's been moistened and kept moist with some press and seal. Uh, and then you can see some of the staining uh, that's resulted around the skin, and that's normal to see with a dressing change. This is actually a good dressing in that it's been kept moist. You can see the wrinkling of the glabrous skin, but it's not so moist that we worry about bacterial overgrowth. The other dressing that you'll hear talked about occasionally is BioBrain. Um, BioBrain is a biosynthetic nylon mesh which is impregnated with porcine collagen type 1. And essentially what it provides is a transparent biologic dressing which uh, gets put on with the first application and stays on until the wound heals. Uh, the, the usual rule of approach is to have the burn to clean the burn uh, of all its blistered skin and dead skin, apply the BioBrain, steri-strip it on, or in some cases staple it, uh, then apply some sort of occlusive dressing so that it adheres, and then at a couple days take it down and have a look. Um, and once it's adherent, it's almost like putting on a skin graft. Once it's adherent, uh, then it's, it tends to stick, uh, and then eventually it will fall off on its own once everything underneath is epithelialized. The challenge with this dressing, as great as it sounds, is that there are few instances where it's ideal, and a lot of times that's because we're not having access to the burn within the first 24 hours, which is ideally when it gets put on a scald burn. Uh, and secondly, um, uh, it's not stocked here in British Columbia, so we have to order it from Toronto, which by definition means that it's going to take uh, at least an overnight trip to get here. So uh, as, as you'll hear people talk about it, and I bring it up for that uh, purpose, but it's not necessarily logistically something that you'll see us use here uh, in Victoria. Uh, just this, this is a paper showing that they did uh, 800 patients treated with BioBrain, um, uh, which showed some success in terms of decreasing the number of uh, surgical surgeries that were required. Um, Again, I just wanted to sort of give a shout out uh, to my pediatric intensive colleagues uh, who've, I think, really uh, helped to ease the transition here um, and make it accessible when it comes uh, to either myself or Sharon or Deb uh, at when, when the time came to be doing these dressing changes in the pediatric ICU. And while logistically it's hard because most of our uh, burn stuff happens here, including our outpatient burn clinic and including where we tend to do most of our work, uh, it really has, I think, been a, a, an easy um, and nice way of providing outpatient burn care to some of these larger burns that don't need admission. Uh, I threw this in there uh, just because when, it talk, when we talk about sedation and pain management, this is something that we've talked about as a division in terms of the use of outpatient burn management and codeine. And for the pediatric surgeons in the room, it's an opportunity for me to kind of pick your brain about uh, what your thoughts are on codeine. Chris sent this article to us when it, the Globe and Mail said codeine killing children. And he said, well, do you use this? Uh, and I said, well, yes, I do, but maybe I shouldn't because there have actually been a couple of pediatric centers in Canada that have taken it off their formulary, uh, formulary, particularly sick kids uh, in Toronto. And I do know that if I go to the ward, uh, they won't let me order codeine on the ward uh, uh, here in Victoria, but uh, I still use it quite a bit as an outpatient, and maybe I shouldn't. So um, I, I'm very curious to hear some of the... Uh, perspective of some of the medical doctors in the room. but um, and When it comes to sort of 
wound management and burn assessment and fluid resuscitation, I guess the question becomes, well, why do we really care? Why do we care if it's a second or third degree burn? Why do we care how it's epithelializing or granulating? Why is that so important? And I think really what it boils down to and what I tell families is that for it really matters in terms of the prognosis. So for a burn that is superficial, um, you can look at it and you can say to the family, you know, I think this burn is going to heal. It's going to heal within 10 days. And chances are there will not be any scarring associated with it. And we hope there won't be any pigment changes associated with it. And that, I think, is reassuring to be able to tell the family in the beginning. Uh, a lot of times, though, when we're looking at these burns, we can say, well, you know, if it heals longer than three weeks, so if when we're looking at a burn and we think it's not going to make it in three weeks' time, I can tell you you've got about an 80% chance that you will have significant problems with hypertrophic scarring. And so that's where the art of plastic surgery comes in, I think, with regards to burn management is making that call in terms of how do we get this wound healed by three weeks so that the risk of burn uh, hypertrophic scarring is as small as we can make it. And so uh, with these dressing changes, uh, often I'll be looking at a burn at about seven to ten days, which coincides often for their first or second dressing change, and looking at that burn and saying, yes, I think this is going to heal within three weeks, or no, I don't think it's going to heal, and therefore it's time to consider doing something in terms of surgery. And for most surgeons, I think if you were to ask them, they're looking at that burn somewhere around 10 to 14 days is when they're making that call. There are things that you can do to try and bump up that timeline, and so there are technologies like laser Doppler, for example, where you can put it over the burn and determine how much dermal perfusion there is to give you some sort of indication about whether or not this is a burn which will heal. And so there are some centers uh, that are using that as a way of assessing who needs an operation and who doesn't. But beyond that, it's just clinical judgment. And probably the, uh, the more you do it, the better you get uh, in terms of predicting who you think is going to have a problem uh, with scarring. So somewhere around that 7 to 14 day window is when I think we need to be looking at these burns and making a decision about getting them healed so that we don't have problems with scarring down the road. Uh, this is just a study that came out of um, the U.S., and they uh, looked at their follow-up strategy, and they assessed burns at two weeks, two months, and then followed them for five years. And they found that burns that were healed by two weeks uh, were burns that did, had no problem with long-term follow-up, and so they didn't have to continue to ask these families to come back. So if we can get a burn healed earlier, the chances are we'll have a better outcome in terms of follow-up. If we can't get it healed, then we take them to the operating room. Uh, and this is the appearance of a typical split thickness skin graft for those who haven't had a chance to see them in the initial stages. Uh, again, this is another Axe body spray. You can see the nice belt line, I think, there. Um, and so uh, we'll uh, take skin from somewhere else in the body. Uh, the donor sites vary a little tiny bit based on the age. So in the very young, I'll tend to use the buttock more so than I'll use the anterior thigh. Um, uh, and that's uh, because it, it makes it a little tiny bit easier in terms of wound care. And that's one instance where a lot of times I'll use either an opsite dressing or a flamazine dressing for um, just hygiene purposes afterwards. Uh, you can see the fish netting uh, of a typical split thickness skin graft. So we do the, what we call meshing for a lot of reasons, but mostly so that, that we can encourage that graft to stick down to the wound bed after it's been debrided and so that a lot of the fluid can get out. And that fish netting is something that often you'll see many years down the road. So uh, we do it to try and increase some of the surface area of skin that we harvest. We also do it mostly to uh, ensure adherence, uh, but it's not necessarily the prettiest thing that you'll see. Uh, down the road. Um, this is what a fresh donor site looks like. So this is at about 10 days when a donor site is healed. Um, it's red and purple and hot and sometimes ugly and you got to sort of sometimes walk families through in terms of what the expectations are. Uh, this is another example of a type of skin graft. This is a full thickness skin graft and we'll use full thickness skin grafts for anatomically sensitive areas like on the face or over joints hands, for example, um, and it has some advantages because it has less secondary scar contracture, which causes less problems with joint contractures over the course of time. Uh, the challenge with full thickness skin grafts is that there's a limited donor site in the body, so there's very few places that we can take this from without running into problems in terms of wound closure. In terms of actually in the operating room, what's new? Well, uh, the only thing 
really, uh, in terms of advances in intraoperative burn management from a surgical perspective, has been the introduction of the VersaJet. The VersaJet is essentially a high-pressure washer. Uh, so you run saline through a, a wand, uh, which you use to do the debridement of the burn. Uh, and it's uh, really easy to use, um, and it's really nice in areas which are kind of a bit technically challenging to get into with it, some of the traditional knives that we use for tangential excision. Uh, and so this is something that's recently been purchased uh, by us here in Victoria and will be available to us any time now, I think, um, within, uh, I just heard from the rep that it is in. So um, uh, Andrew probably has a bit of experience using it in Vancouver, um, so he can teach us all how to do it. Um, uh, the other thing that you'll hear about uh, from families is spray on skin. Um, uh, when my dad sent me this, I thought, Dad, you're crazy. Uh, but it actually exists. Um, and I always like it when I get uh, medical updates in my profession from my dad, uh, who's constantly online being like, oh, this is cool. Uh, so uh, uh, Resell is a uh, spray on skin technology that was developed in Australia. Um, and what they do is they uh, have a little kit that you can buy, um, and you harvest a very small portion of very thin split thickness skin graft, so six one thousandths of an inch. Uh, then you put it in that little spot, that, the black little well that's there. You add some trips in, which they send, and you let it incubate for about half an hour. And then you take it and you separate the epithelium from the dermis. You scrape the junctional cells with a knife. You aspirate them and you inject them into an aerosolizer, and then you spray it onto the skin. And so they have quite a few studies coming out of Australia showing that with early debridement and spray on skin that they uh, have uh, a really fast uh, healing. Uh, the critiques of this um, are such that they, they say that if the burn had been left to heal on its own, it probably would have been just fine. So they do an earlier debridement and application of um, uh, spray on skin, and they have excellent results when you see them. Um, but a lot of the people who are sort of a little bit more cynical will say, well, why are you debriding them at five days? And if you just left in another three, it might have been okay anyway. So um, it's something that is out there, though, and I think something that we need to kind of be attentive to. Long-term follow-up is significant for adults as well as kids. This is an axillary uh, fold scar contracture uh, following, an, again, another Axe body spray. Um, so this is something that we'll often take kids back for over the course of time. You can see on his chest, uh, he's actually got some fairly significant hypertrophic scarring. And this is following a skin grafting procedure. So the question is whether or not maybe he had some bacterial burden there that didn't allow his skin to heal, uh, or maybe just adequate debridement or time in terms of choosing a time to debride him. Facial uh, hyper scarring is also a significant problem. This is a severe uh, forelid ectropion. Um, this uh, poor 17-year-old is someone that we encountered on uh, a trip to China. Uh, he's blind in both eyes as a result of exposure. Um, and um, uh, something that I'm just really glad that we don't see a lot of that here, uh, given the wound care strategies that we do have. Donor sites are not benign, um, so despite the fact that they heal within 10 days, you can see an example of what is considered a good result uh, from a, a donor site, and that's a hypopigmented patch. Uh, this is not such a good result, so that's actually hypertrophic scarring uh, on the right-hand side there in a, in a donor site. And this is one of the reasons that in terms of uh, that decision to operate, we don't enter into it lightly um, because uh, you want to make sure that you're uh, improving things in the area of the burn and not necessarily adding to other wounds elsewhere in the body, which can be significant problems. One of the things that gets emphasized anytime you have a talk in plastic surgery is the difference between keloids and hypertrophic scarring. And so that was um, on the ankle was a, a contact burn from a, a motor vehicle accident. Uh, and you can see that he's got evidence of hypertrophic scarring where it's thick. Um, and that's probably about three years out from the injury as opposed to a keloid scar, which is a, this is a friction burn from a fall. Uh, and that's just a scar that knows no bounds uh, and continues to grow and grow. And that has implications for uh, uh, management over the course of time. The other thing that we'll encounter both in adults and in kids is burn itch. 
Um, uh, often though in children it's difficult because they are not telling you why uh, they're uncomfortable and fussy and you don't often know if it's pain but a lot of times it's just because they're really really itchy um, uh, and there are uh, a lot of sort of non-pharmacologic strategies that we use for this in terms of massaging it and lots of moisturizer we emphasize that until the cows come home in terms of keeping them moist not allowing them to draw out we use compression therapy as a way of trying to decrease the hypervascularization of the wound uh, or the burn or the scar uh, as a way of trying to keep all those mediators out of there so that it isn't quite as itchy. Uh, oatmeal baths have shown to be beneficial. Um, Ridididine, um, Benadryl, some of the uh, antihistamines that also have been helpful from a pharm pharmacologic perspective. Uh, this is a tragic story. This was a three-year-old, two-year-old who was uh, in China with her family visiting, and they were walking past a restaurant, and somebody took the hot oil out the back door, and it landed, unfortunately, in her stroller. Uh, so she was sitting in hot oil for however long it took to get her, her parents to get her out of the stroller. Uh, and then she was uh, transferred uh, through Hong Kong uh, to Vancouver, which is where the family was from. Uh, and she had not terribly significant total body surface area burns, um, uh, but she had the worst hypertrophic scarring uh, and burn itch uh, that uh, they've ever seen uh, in Vancouver. And so she would actually come in, and I got to know this family quite well because I got to put the casts on her, which was the only thing that would prevent her from rubbing herself raw at nighttime because she would kick in, uh, her legs and she'd rub her legs against the sheets. And she'd end up with the sores that you can see there. And so constantly this wound was breaking down because she was so itchy. Uh, so the only seem thing to, that seemed to work was to put her in casts uh, so that at least she couldn't get at it. Um, uh, she had lots and lots and lots of help, that poor young girl. Um, so uh, scar contractures uh, also are significant in the hand. And that's because the hand will continue to grow over the course of time. And so as they get spurts, you'll see uh, occasionally intervals in a child's life where when they have had a palmer burn, uh, that they end up coming back to see you because all of a sudden their finger is starting to bend. The other thing that I think is important to note is anytime that you do a, uh, and I can't quite get the finger, the uh, point, sorry. It does leave pigment changes behind, and so again, it's not a benign thing uh, when you do uh, full thickness grafting on fingers and children uh, that you have to warn families that this is something that the kid's always going to know that something happened here. Um, you're always going to know that something happened here. It's not something that you can kind of say, oh yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's no big deal, or it will always be a constant reminder, and sometimes uh, a socially stigmatizing one for kids. So having talked about all that, um, uh, this is a project that they're working on uh, at BC Children's with funding through the BC Firefighters. Uh, this was the impetus of one of the burn nurses on the ward there who just decided that she'd seen way too many scalds and preventable injuries. And so took it upon herself to come up with a program and spent two years developing two hots for tots. And it's now uh, something that's available through the BC Children's website. And she came, essentially came up with the three Bs of uh, burn prevention in children, and that was to be aware of the dangers, to be close to your child at all times, uh, and also to burn proof your house. And so she has developed a couple of promotional uh, things in terms of a DVD that's available. Um, and she's gone around to community health ter ter um, um, teaching sessions with new mums and babies, talking about what the risks are. And, you know, one of the reasons she did it was because she was so astounded at how uh, little people knew about what risks actually were. You know, that, you know, drinking your coffee and holding your kid at the same time seemed to be a good way of time management as opposed to, um, you know, that actually is a really significant problem and something that we don't, we see quite often in terms of a, an issue. So um, if you're interested, uh, it's all in the BC Children's uh, website and you can go and get links there. Uh, there's posters and everything that you can get and pamphlets that you can hand out in your office. Uh, and when it comes to health promotion, I, I, this is a shout out to Cindy actually, who spent a lot of time. Uh, Cindy Bercher, Dr. Cindy Bercher is one of the pediatric plastic surgeons in Vancouver. She spent a lot of time uh, with um, health advocacy, particularly with regards to the fireplace contact burns. Um, and this was an announcement from I can't remember the association's name. It's something like the 
I don't know, the fireplace people uh, in, uh, in the States. Um, and they have essentially now said that they're making recommendations that there need to be improved warnings on glass fire, uh, frontings for gas fireplaces. And also that they're going to make a recommendation that uh, uh, gating becomes mandatory uh, for gas fireplaces. Um, and so uh, that's something that's coming on the forefront uh, that I think we'll start to see a lot more of gates around gas fireplaces, uh, like the traditional wood stoves that we saw at uh, times in the past. So where do I think pediatric burn management is going? Well, uh, I think we're going to start to see a lot more use of telemedicine. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit in a second about um, how uh, the centralized model of burn management sometimes uh, doesn't always help us in terms of uh, looking out for uh, family-focused uh, care. I think we're going to see better wound dressings uh, over the course of time, um, and that includes uh, more biologic dressings. Uh, they're looking at now at having timed release uh, antimicrobial dressing. So uh, as soon as there is a certain bacterial load uh, detected by the dressing in the wound, they'll start to release um, antibiotics as opposed to just empirically treating everybody. Um, I think we'll have better technologies in terms of looking at more accessible technologies to help us figure out right from the beginning what's going to need surgery and what won't. Uh, I think we're going to see more in the introduction of biologic skin substitutes uh, eventually, um, and that means less donor sites, uh, hopefully. Um, uh, and then my hope uh, is that as we see increased education, we'll actually see decreased need um, so to kind of, we started off with our statistics here, and I kind of wanted to end a little bit on our statistics uh, or our, our sort of goal or, or strategy here in Victoria. Um, on the right, you'll see um, the ABA burn center criteria in terms of who needs to be sent to a, a burn center, and included in that uh, are uh, children under the age of five. Um, uh, I think. I, and I'm not sure if I've actually seen this written down here, but my understanding is that here in Victoria, we sort of say, well, if it's a burn that's greater than 30% total body surface area or has other significant associated trauma, that perhaps they're best treated in Vancouver. And that's maybe something that's up to debate, but it's certainly the impression that I've gotten here so far uh, in terms of maybe those kids uh, that are relatively uncommon uh, but perhaps measured at the at the bigger center as opposed to here, and that's something that I think we can we can talk about, and and I, along that same line, we've had lots of conversations recently with the provincial trauma registry um, uh, or provincial trauma services something, something like that. Um, in terms of uh, our status, and one of the reasons that um, Dr. Dr. Nickerson is here is our status is a burn centre. And uh, what we do and what we feel comfortable doing and, uh, and the direction that we should be taking. And while sort of looking at that, this is a paper from the States, and essentially what they said is that uh, they're a burn centre. They see lots of burns sent from uh, different places. Most burns sent from other places are less than 6% total body surface area, and most of them are discharged within 24 hours. And that comes at huge expense to the system um, because they were talking about a helicopter trip uh, on average uh, takes cost about $12,000. And the inpatient stay at a quaternary burn centre costs this much money. And if we can do more to educate uh, people, their, their rationale was that in the environment in the States, anytime any kid had any type of burn, you know, no matter how big it was, it had to go to the centre. And that's because practitioners didn't know what to do or they were scared um, because they, the medical legal environment in the States. And I, I certainly don't want to see us get to that model. And I think um, the more we can do here in terms of keeping our skills up uh, and, and keeping everybody abreast by coming to talks like this, then, uh, then I think uh, the better it'll be for the people in our health authority. And along that same line, uh, when I was thinking about, you know, what I'd like to see for our, our group, um, I sort of came up with a proposed vision statement, and that's to see the continued compassionate, informed, and consistent burn care provided to patients and their families in BEHA. And, and I think we do compassionate and informed really well here. I think we struggle a little bit with the consistency uh, from what I've seen, and that, I think, is not unique uh, when you have a, a lot of different practitioners providing services uh, to kids. Um, but I think 
think us as a division and us as a health authority can really work to streamline some of those processes to make it easier for families, to make it easier for um, uh, uh, people who are learning, um, uh, to make it easier for teaching and to make it easier for all of us. Um, and so I, I think in terms of directions, that's kind of where I'd like to see it go. And, and I'll end on, uh, you know, pediatric surgery is fun, uh, mostly because you get to hang out with your friends. And this is five uh, Royal College certified plastic surgeons around one hand. Um, uh, so I had a really good time uh, in Vancouver and it was a good year, um, uh, mostly for the collegial aspect of it. And some of you may recognize the guy with the duct tape on his loops, that's Dr. Hill. Uh, um, so he's, uh, he's obviously not doing very well because he can't get, afford to get his loops fixed. But um, uh, um, so anyway, uh, Children's was a great time. Uh, and if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Dr. Naismith. That's a great question, and I'm supposed to repeat them for the people uh, who are watching in other places. And the question was from Dr. Naismith about uh, hypoglycemia in children and how are we monitoring for that endpoint. Um, uh, and the honest reality is, I don't know, Amanda. Are we checking blood sugars? Uh, So the answer for people uh, elsewhere is, is essentially it's one's daily blood sugar monitoring uh, and uh, having an understanding of young children in terms of what their maintenance requirements will be. Dr. Penny.
Great. Great. And for those in the background, that was Dr. Penny saying that codeine is bad uh, and that if you're looking for dosaging, the uh, post-operative surgical order sheets have, have that information available. Along that same line, in terms of uh, route of administration of pain medicine, um, I have seen occasionally subcutaneous administration for burns. And this, this I think, you know, in my training has been something that we don't tend to do because of the degree of third spacing that occurs, uh, that it tends to be a relatively inconsistent route of administration. So uh, more often we, we either say to give it orally uh, if they're able to uh, absorb it that way or intravenously and to try and avoid uh, in kids as in adults some of the other alternative routes of administration because uh, they don't tend to be as reliable um, just because of the degree that they can tend to go everywhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a quick contact. So that's literally someone coming up, hitting, and falling backwards. Ideally, what I would like to see happen is to have everybody in the emergency department feel comfortable putting on uh, these silver dressings and doing it on their own. Um, uh, and, you know, that's one of the challenges that I think we face here in Victoria is a lot of times when you're looking for us uh, in wound care, I'd love to be present for every initial application so that I could come and say, yes, this is the burn, this is the total body surface area. This is, this is what we need to do. Um, but the reality is, is that we're not always available for that because of the work that we do here and because we're just not on site. Um, and so I, I think what I would like to see is have everybody feel comfortable putting on uh, those uh, dressings. Now, if it's a burn that needs to get admitted, and, and that's presumably the burns that you're talking about, I, and, and we'll have to talk about this as a division because I don't really want to speak for the rest of my colleagues, but I think ideally I would come and do the total body surface area burn, and so in that instance we keep them warm and dry uh, until I get a chance to assess the burn uh, and apply the dressing. And I think um, to me that just allows me to feel comfortable about what actually, what volume I'm giving them in terms of the resuscitative fluids, um, but also be able to kind of coach the family a little tiny bit in terms of what I expect their hospital stay to be, whether or not it's going to be a short stay or a long stay, or what their potential road is going to look like over the course of the time. Um, and, and, and I really say that with trepidation because I, I really don't want to get us into a situation where because of the reality of life, we're just not accessible to you. Um, uh, so um, ideally, that's what I'd like. Essentially do nothing. Yeah, keep them, keep them sterile, sterile dressings, um, like just sheets even, uh, and then warm sheets. Keep them, keep them warm. And based on our numbers, those aren't going to be large numbers. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks very much, everybody.